Well, good afternoon. My name is Lauren Hebel Osborne. I'm with Derby Experiences and joining us today is Pat Day. And we have been so blessed over the years to have Pat Day as part of our Derby Experiences program. Um, he's a Hall of Fame jockey, multiple Eclipse award-winning jockey, and he's been in the game his entire life, 32 years of riding, 32 years plus of riding, and over 9,000 winners. So we are just going to talk to him today because many of you who would have been joining us last week um, at the, or two weeks ago at the Kentucky Derby would have had the great opportunity to meet Pat Day in person. So let me just welcome Pat and so glad to have you with us. And um, it certainly has been my experience, Pat, that people who have great faith um, don't have as many fears. And so I'm sure that right now you're passing along a lot of great comfort to a lot of people in the industry and worldwide. So how are you doing during all of this pandemic? Well, doing, doing very well, Lauren. Thank you. And uh, thanks for having me on. But um, yeah, I, you know, I, I endeavor to not be fearful. I know that uh, God is on the throne in control and and as a matter of fact, I checked with him, checked in with him early this morning. <laughs> surprise of surprises, he was not up there pacing the floor, wringing his hands, wondering how is all this going to work out. No, I, uh, I looked to him. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And um, uh, he assured me that he has it all very much under control. So, well, and we've got some good news. We've got horses returning to Churchill Downs with the possibility, or we believe, to be starting our racing on what would be. Preakness Day. So, uh, but let's, uh, let's rack back a couple of weeks to Derby Day. How did you celebrate the first Saturday in May um, for your pandemic derby? Well, as, as, as you know, they, uh, they ran the Arkansas Derby and, and uh, the whole race card from Oakland Park that day. And uh, so we, my wife and I just hunkered down here in the living room and watched the races from Oakland. And uh, it was, it was bittersweet. Um, but you know, with, with the, uh, with the, the Derby being postponed as well as all of the activities and festivities, uh, surrounding the Derby and, and everybody, uh, staying in, um, it was springtime, but it didn't feel like springtime. Right. Uh, it was springtime. The birds were singing, the flowers were blooming, the grass, uh, you know, grass was turning green, but without those activities, uh, leading up to the Derby, um, it was like the Derby wasn't in town at all. And so uh, it was, it was, um, it was unusual, but it's, Indeed. You know, it's unusual circumstances around the world right now. So. Right. Well, so Churchill did uh, definitely try to, um, they tried to change uh, things up with a virtual Derby. Um, so um, I'm just curious uh, if you had had a chance to ride one of those Kentucky Derby our triple crown winners there in that contest. Who do you think you would have picked? Well, I, I would have picked Secretariat. Um, <laughs> okay. And, and of course, I'm, I have the luxury of having watched that and know that he he won the virtual derby. But um, no. And who I, behind was, that? Who I'm behind sorry? that would you have chosen? Who would you have chosen behind that? I mean, I know that uh, anything that Eddie Arcaro wrote, is that something you might pick? Uh, you know, that was well before my time, and, and uh, I'd have probably picked somebody that was uh, uh, more frequent, you know, uh, in the, in the not-too-distant past. But um, that was kind of neat, the way they the way they done that, and, and uh, uh, I don't think it was a big surprise that Secretary wind up on top. Right. Well, again, for a lot of our Kentucky Derby experiences, when our guests do come to the Kentucky Derby, they get to meet – wonderful folks uh, and experts in the in this game. Pat Day being one of those. Uh, he is the all-time leading rider. And when you come to Churchill Downs with Derby Experiences, you not only get to meet Pat in person, but you also get to see a statue that we have of Pat. Can you tell us a little bit about that iconic statue that is in the Aristides Garden? Well, I, you know, <clears throat> we've had a phenomenal amount of success at Churchill Downs. It's been very good to us. Um, and when I retired, uh, Churchill Downs threw a little little uh, retirement party for me. And um, uh, at the event that evening, uh, they, um, Steve Sexton, who was the president at the time, 
uh, called me up a, up to the podium and gave me a little block of of bronze and he said uh, Churchill Downs would like to to uh, have a statue made in your likeness uh, place it in the in the rose garden next to Aristides and he said uh, but you get to pick the you get to pick the pose and he said we've got a distinct feeling on you know pretty certain what what pose you will choose but that that choice will be yours and of course the the, the pose is with me with my hands up raised after we were successful in that great race on Little E.T. back in 1992. And, and uh, when I got on the ground, I just, I, I looked to the heavens, put my hands up and just uh, was thanking Jesus for uh, allowing me the privilege and the joy of, of experiencing uh, the victory in that great race. And can you, uh, yeah, can I'm you sorry, tell the audience? Yeah, can you tell the audience a little bit about the hat that you were wearing that day and the significance of the baseball cap that you wore that day? Oh, absolutely. The, the, um, We'd been in the habit, the jockeys, a number of years ago, they'd started um, uh, started making a trip to uh, uh, Coastar Children's Hospital on Oaks Day. Uh, they've since discontinued that because Oaks Day has just gotten so busy and they start so early and, uh, you know, it just became so rushed. As a matter of fact, the last time we went down there, I had to get out at the corner of 4th and Central and run up to the, uh, to the facility because because I was in the first race. Get there. But uh, yeah, but we we would go to the Coast Air Children's Hospital and uh, visit with the children, hand out some, you know, uh, whatever, some posters and, and so forth. And uh, that day uh, we was down there and, and they'd given us these ball caps, kind of like a ball cap, painter's cap uh, to wear. And it, just, it said Coast Air Children's Hospital on it. And <clears throat> so we were uh, there in the hallway and, and a young man came by on a gurney and he just had a treatment for, I, I believe it was for cancer of some type. Uh, and he was trying desperately to, to be conversing, but you could tell he was, he was hurting. He was pretty sick. And, and um, uh, I took the cap off and I said, you know, if I should be fortunate enough to win this race tomorrow, I'm going to wear this cap for you and all the children here at Coast uh -huh. And, and uh, by the grace of God, we won the race and, and was able to, don that cap in the winter circle and in, in, uh, in remembrance of them. That's fantastic. So I know a lot of our customers that come uh, when they want to talk to you, of course, they're always talking about their favorite horse that you've ridden, but you've had a, a your riding style. You've always been called patient Pat uh, because of that. That is rather your, your, your moniker that we've talked about. But in my, in my estimation, patience also means, uh, calm, measured, gives a lot of confidence. Can you talk a little bit about why you think your style of riding was so successful, especially with young horses? Can you explain maybe to the to folks about how that confidence uh, and calmness translates to an animal? Well, I, you know, to, to back up just a little bit, I, I believe that God blessed me with tremendous talent and ability uh, to, to ride races uh, a, 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 an innate ability to communicate with horses uh, and subsequently horses um, I, I'd, I'd read one time uh, Eddie R. Carroll was uh, doing an interview and, and talking about the difference between him and Shoemaker and he said the difference is I have to make horses run and horses want to run for Shoemaker and I found that to be true for, to me, uh, for me to a large degree Horses wanted to do what I wanted them to do when I wanted them to do it, whether that was to settle in the early stages or to give me their very best in the drive with a, a minimal amount of encouragement on my part. And, and uh, in, in conjunction with that, I had this uncanny knack of knowing when to ask them to give me their very best that ultimately would equate to victory. Uh, and, and, you know, I was, they only pay off at the finish line. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in front before or after. If you're not in front of the finish line, you, you don't get your picture taken. And, and I had the uncanny knack of knowing when to ask them to, to uh, and to time my move to be in front of the finish line. And, oh, but uh, a I, calm, I would, I would argue to say a calm rider, you have great cadence of breath. You're certainly not with an animal. They certainly take a lot of that cadence and that calmness. And 
I, I would have to think that that is a, a great communication tool in and of itself, that you're very calm, and so therefore that translates confidence. Well, certainly, and, and confidence is a, is a major factor. You know, if, if you happen to watch the races um, and you see a rider that, that uh, wins a race on the card early in the program, uh, and certainly if, if the horse was a bit of a long shot, it, it just seems to bolster the confidence of the rider. And through the course of the afternoon, it doesn't mean they're going to win every race, but I think you can pretty much count on the horses that they ride through the remainder of the program uh, to run to the very best of their ability. Uh, you know, it, confidence, <clears throat> when the rider has confidence, he exudes that confidence, he passes that along to the horses and, and they respond, subsequently they, they respond to it and from it. Uh, and by the same token, if, if a rider is, is uh, lacking confidence, uh, horses don't respond, uh, you know, they, or they respond to that and, and uh, all, subsequently don't, don't give their very best. So in the Kentucky Derby, it's probably even more paramount that you're calm, given all of the, uh, the circumstances of 160,000 people that are there. But also something new this year that I'd love to have your comment on, we have a new 20-horse gate uh, that'll be employed now in the, in the Derby. So Talk to me a little bit about the strategy of how that would be written, how you might coax a horse out of the gate or have a different strategy than you would have with the, with the double gate. Uh, personally, I really don't see any difference. I mean, obviously, you know, when they had the auxiliary gate, there was a gap between the number 14 horse and the, and the, the number 15 horse who was in the, in the first star, uh, stall of the auxiliary gate. So there was a bit of a gap between those two. And, and uh, sometimes the horse that broke from the 15 would have a tendency to kind of duck in a little bit to, to get over close to the, to the 14, or the 14 uh, would duck out just a little bit. But I've ridden out of both of those, uh, out of the outside, you know, out of the auxiliary gate and out of the main starting gate. And, and uh, I, I really didn't see any, didn't have any problem with that. Uh, obviously, it's, it's nice that they're going to be able to have the full the full field in one starting gate. Uh, there won't be any gap between the between the stalls uh, from one to twenty, and and um, uh, I'm I'm interested to see how it goes. I don't think there will be a, a major difference, but it certainly wouldn't um, wouldn't. You know, I, I rode forty nine er off of the extreme outside, and and uh, the year before, Gato del Sol had won uh, the Derby from that that same post position. Uh, or from, from the auxiliary gate and from far on the outside. And, and uh, Arthur Hancock came to me. He was the owner of Goddard del Sol. And he came to me the day of, of the Derby and he said, Pat, he said, look, uh, you know, if you draw a straight line from the 18 hole or whatever it is that we were in, way on the outside, way down, draw a straight line to the break of the turn. Uh, it, it's not a significant amount of ground that you are more that you're covering from that post position than from the one. If, if you draw a straight line from the one hole to the turn and from the 20 hole to the turn, it's, it's not a significant amount of ground that you're losing. Uh, what happens though, if you, if you come away from there and then, uh, try to duck all the way down to the fence and, and then go. And he said, so when, when, you, when you leave there on 49er, he said, just draw a bead on the turn and just go straight down the racetrack. And, and we did that. Uh, we wound up running second to winning colors. Right. Um, I think we were just second best that afternoon. Uh, with 49er, there was a, a big question as to whether he could get a mile and a quarter. Uh, they, I'd actually gotten the mount. Uh, they'd asked me to, uh, he'd been a, a, a real anxious horse early on. Mm -hmm. And he'd been jumping into the race and then uh, putting too much into it and not finishing. And so they'd asked me to ride him and, and see if I could take him back, uh, get him to, to, to relax and conserve his energy and, and hopefully get the mile and a quarter. Uh, and so, uh, and, and we'd been successful in doing that. Uh, came derby time and, and uh, so we broke, we took a, took a beat on the turn. Uh, we were actually second to winning colors as we got to the turn in a, in a really good spot. And uh, when we got into the turn, winning colors changed leads and accelerated, ran away from me. Uh, 49er was very relaxed at that point, and I felt that it would be not in my best interest to try to go with her at that point. Right. Uh, he was relaxed and conserving his energy, and, 
I just felt that uh, when I asked him, he was going to go. But if I stepped on the accelerator, it was going to get stuck. He wasn't going to come back to me. Right. And so subsequently, I let him uh, bide his time, you know, down the backside and around the turn. And when we come to the top of the stretch and I called on him, he, he responded beautifully. Uh, coming to the eighth pole, I thought I was going to catch winning colors. Right, right. And then as I, as I ran up on her, uh, she dug in. She was game uh, under Gary Stevens. And uh, just she held me off, uh, beat me by a diminishing, I guess, about a half a neck or something. But right. uh, it, was a, it was a big race uh, for 49er, a big, big race for winning colors. And, uh, but he kind of a long-winded story. But No, it's great. Uh, it's Hillary Gate coming off the outside. Uh, didn't have uh, didn't have a real bearing on the outcome. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, there's just there's been a lot of conversation about the 20 horse field and Gary Stevens, who we spoke to um, last week. He he was saying he thought it was going to be pretty interesting. They had uh, about adjusting a strategy as well for uh, for the gate without the gap anymore for the odds gate. So um, so you have been a part of our program now for I think gosh seven or eight years now. So uh, you have any great stories of some of the folks that you have spoken to? What's a common question that you get asked by some of our, by some of our guests that come? Well, the questions that, that's inevitably asked and which is impossible to, to explain or describe is, how does it feel to win the derby? Ah, okay. You know, and and uh, there, there really aren't words that could clearly express that. I mean, exciting, exhilarating, uh, over the moon, uh, right. You know, I've, I've, I've spent a lot of time since 1992 when we won that race aboard Little E.T., the one and only time we won it. And I think the only thing that would be better than winning it once would be to win it twice. Right. Uh, we never got that accomplished. But, uh, you know, I've, I've given a lot of thought trying to come up with the right words to say that could, uh, you know, could describe that or explain that. And, and it's, it's indescribable is the only word to come up with. Um, but that ultimately, that's that's the Big that's the question, question that, that I get asked the most. What what does it feel like to win the derby? Like, how did I'd say, feel? yeah, I'd say you also probably get asked get asked who's the best horse you ever rode or who's your favorite horse. Do you have an answer? Is that the same horse or a different horse? Well, the best horse I ever rode was Easy Goer. He finished second to Sunday Silence in the Derby. Uh, but I couldn't say that he was my favorite. He was one of okay. my favorites. Okay. But, uh, you know, I, I rode for 32 years, over 40,000 races. And, uh, you know, I rode some nondescript horses that, uh, you know, they weren't real fast, but they tried real hard. And they just had a special place in my heart. I just appreciated their, their, their desire. You know, I mean, they, they, right. would, they would run as hard as they could. They'd give you everything they had. They just couldn't run very fast. And I uh, had, a, had a real soft spot in my heart for them. And, and Certainly, the, the better horses, um, they all had their own personalities and quirks and likes and dislikes. And uh, ultimately, I just, I loved them all uh, and got along with most of them. And, and uh, very, it'd be very difficult to pick uh, the one my favorite uh, in it. that regard. Switching gears just a little bit, because we also have the great um, benefit of having a Breeders' Cup here. In, uh, in Kentucky as well here in the fall at Keeneland. And you were the very first Breeders' Cup winner on Wild Again. And uh, so talk to us a little bit how that, how the Breeders' Cup has, has changed over these years since you, since 1984, I think. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a great, great two days of racing now. Of course, when it started, it was just one day. It was seven races, uh, $10 million in one afternoon. And I remember a few years previous to that when they were first talking about the concept, <laughs> excuse me. And, uh, you know, at the time, I think there was one or $2 million races in the country. I think uh, the Arlington million uh, might've been the only race that was, that was worth a million. And so as they're kicking around the idea that they're going to have seven races and give away $10 million, it was like, not in my lifetime. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, in 1984, it, it came, came to fruition and uh, has turned out to be uh, uh, a great day and now two great days of championship racing. It's uh, uh, the best racing in the world uh, over those two days. I was fortunate enough to, to ride a few, few uh, races uh, in the inaugural Breeders' Cup and was very fortunate to have secured the mount on a horse called Wild Again. 
uh, in the Breeders' Cup Classic. Uh, I believe that that was, um, uh, that was divinely orchestrated. Uh, in January of that year, I'd, I'd had an encounter with Jesus Christ in a hotel room in Miami. I became born again, got set free from a lifestyle of drugs and alcohol and, and got focused. Um, initially, I thought I was, I was being called into the ministry. Uh, after consulting with the chaplain at uh, the racetrack in, in Arkansas, uh, the Lord revealed to me a dear friend of mine, Mike Spencer, was a chaplain there. Uh, but uh, uh, the Lord revealed to me that he'd saved me to work within racing, not to leave it. Take the talent and ability and do the best that I could, but all the while be open to opportunities to give him the praise and the honor and the glory and uh, to use any success, any, that, that platform, uh, to promote the cause of Christ. I immediately thought about the Kentucky Derby. Obviously, that's the biggest platform in all the racing. Uh, right. we, we didn't win the Derby that year, uh, but rolled around the fall of the year, and uh, here we come with the Breeders' Cup. And as I said, I was very fortunate to have secured the mount on, on Wild again uh, through a, a series of events that I think only God could have orchestrated. Uh, and then he, he ran a, an incredible race. I've never been on a horse before or since that tried any harder than he did uh, in the stretch run. Uh, he held off Slew of Gold and Gate Dancer in a, in a, a ding-dong battle, they called it, yeah. uh, coming to the finish line, a lot of bumping and jostling and, and um, lengthy inquiry after the conclusion of the race. Uh, I think 9, 10, 11 minutes, the stewards were reviewing the films and uh, ultimately, they, uh, they took Gate Dancer down, placed him third behind Slew of Gold. Um, I, I recall once they, they made the race official, uh, I got back on wild again. This entire time, they'd had all three horses circling in front of the grandstand waiting for the official sign. So when, once they made it official and I got back on wild again, um, I, I got to tell you, I wasn't, I wasn't really keen on, on the Lord at that moment. I was pretty keen on Pat Day. <laughs> uh, just won this big $3 million race. And so as they're walking the horse in a circle, uh, I've got my back to the grandstand and I'm thinking, you know, when we turn and face the grandstand, I'm going to take my helmet off and wave at the crowd. And if the volume goes up, oh, I'll know they're looking at me. You know, I'm going <laughs> to play the crowd a little bit. Yeah. And, and so when we turned and, and to face the grandstand, I reached up to grab my helmet and it was almost like the audible voice of God said, it's not them. And at that moment, I just, I looked to the heavens and I said, thank you, Jesus. Um, and they subsequently, somebody took a picture of that. And I think they closed out the credits at the, at the end of the uh, taping of the, of the Breeders' Cup uh, with that, that uh, with me on wild again, looking to the heavens. Uh, yeah. And, and, and uh, special moment. Uh, it, it, but I, as I said, I think, I think that was divinely orchestrated by the Lord himself. So now riding at Keeneland, it's going to be at Keeneland here in the fall. So you are also the leading rider, have several leading title uh, uh, titles at Keeneland. So that track is a little different um, to, to ride at because they, they oftentimes, because of the, uh, the size of the racetrack, you'll have two uh, finish lines oftentimes based on the, the distance of the race. Can you give any insight uh, or explanation to some of our guests um, about why they why they have the two different uh, finish lines? Well, you know, I've I've not ridden the the track since they'd redone that. Uh, they okay. they changed the uh, changed the um, what am I trying to say? Configuration, yeah, yeah, but. yeah. They the the first turn used to be a little little tricky. It seemed like they had a flat spot on the rail and it would jump back at you. But they've changed all of that. The reason for the two line two finish lines is because the, the, the primary finish line is so close to the turn uh, and, and the track being a mile and a 16th, if, if they run a mile and a 16th race, uh, it's, it's so close to the, to the turn, uh, it, very, it, it causes a real jam up. And so they run okay. a mile and a 16th starting and finishing at the 16th pole. Uh, but all the other races will be uh, will finish at the, at the primary finish line. And now this may be a, a too technical of a question for some folks, but when you say it's, it's close to the final turn because horses are switching their leads, 
um, as they're, so if you're trying to get the very, the maximum effort there in the stretch, is that part of when you say it's a jam up because it's difficult for a horse that's on its right lead to then switch back to its left to make, safely make that, negotiate that turn? How, when you're saying jam up, explain what you mean by that. Well, the, the jam up occurs early on in the race. Uh, uh, okay. If the starting, okay. If the starting gate is, is just a short distance from the turn. I understand, okay. Um, you know, like with, with the Kentucky Derby, you've got uh, a better than a quarter of a mile run from the starting gate to the turn. Um, if we were to start and finish at the finish line in the Kentucky Derby, you've got about a 16th of a mile into right. the first turn. And, and so everybody wants to get over close to the, to the rail. You want to save ground into and around the first turn. Uh, and, and so the horses from the outside, if you've got just a short run, they're, they're going to be trying to get past the, the horses inside, trying to make their way over, and it's going to cause everybody to, to jam up. Okay. Uh, I thought you meant toward the end of, I thought you were talking about the end of the race instead of, uh, of moving the finish line of how that impacted your ride to the finish uh, at Keeneland if they had the first or the second um, finish well, line. So, yeah. you, you do have to be cognizant of the fact that they start and finish at the 16th pole. Right. And so you have a shorter run to the, to the finish line than, than in the normal race. You know, you, you would have almost a, a quarter of a mile from the time you come off the turn to the finish line normally in the mile in the 16th race you you've got a 16th of a mile uh, less ground to to use there so would you say that uh, riders who regularly are at keeneland would have an advantage uh versus some some folks from uh that don't ride that or even some some individuals who are coming from england or ireland uh, if you're talking in regards to the to the breeders cup races yes, i would sir. say uh, they're all professional riders. They will have either walked the course or uh, certainly watched the races prior to their, you know, their time to perform and participate. And uh, it'll, it'll have no bearing, uh, basically, on, on the outcome, I don't believe. Okay. Well, let's see. I, I think my last question is, when do you an anticipate now you're in a role with the uh, racetrack chaplaincy? So um, at Churchill Downs, when do you think that you'll be able to get back and uh, be doing some of the work that you do uh, at Churchill Downs? Have you been given a timeline yet? Well, the, the, the chaplain is out there doing the work right now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my role at, over the last couple of, year, couple of years is I, I've been the president of the council for the Kentucky Racetrack Chaplaincy. And of course, uh, I believe that the role of the council uh, very simply is to provide the chaplains who are doing the work, providing them with what they need to do the work the Lord's called them to. Uh, and our chaplain here at Churchill Downs, Joseph Del Rosario, and uh, the lady that we have over the women and children's ministry, Jessica Singleton, uh, they've been out there, uh, they've been doing some online stuff with the, with the folks. And now that people are, you know, the, with the horses starting to come on the grounds yesterday, uh, they're there. Uh, they've got some emergency uh, provisions for them in case they needed some toiletry items and, and um, uh, some food, you know, some non-perishable food items in case they came in on the truck with the horses and, and uh, not able to get them something to eat. Uh, so they're there. Uh, they're going through the barn area and, of course, through the mornings and visiting with the folks as they're coming in, see if there's anything they can do for them. Uh, Joseph is continuing to stream a church service on Monday evenings on Facebook. And, and so they're, they're, they're continuing to work. Uh, our chaplain in Northern Kentucky at Turfway Park and, and uh, also works at Belterra, used to be uh, River Downs in the summertime. Uh, they've had horses up there and, and until they discontinued the racing, uh, he was still going out and he's still going out now uh, you know, ministering to the folks through the barn area, social distancing, of course. And right. then uh, like, like Chaplain Joseph, he's, he's uh, streaming his service on Monday evenings uh, so that the folks can, uh, as many of the churches are doing, uh, can stay in contact with their, with their chaplain or their pastor and, and continue to receive the spiritual nourishment, encouragement, guidance, and direction that they normally would. Well, I think everyone for our Derby experiences can see that uh, when you join 
and attend uh, with Derby Experiences, you get more than tickets. You get an opportunity to meet our wonderful Pat Day here, ask him questions yourself. Um, I know you share my optimism uh, and uh, belief that we're gonna get to see you in September in person and uh, everyone can uh, get an autograph, socially distanced, of course, probably, but uh, get their autograph and ask Pat your own question. So I wanna thank you again for taking time to just spend with us, have a little chat, and um, we'll see you in September, I think, so. <laughs> uh, Lord willing, we look forward to that for sure, but uh, I, I just gotta tell you, you know, the times that, uh, that I've been able to work with Clint events, uh, Derby experience, and to meet and greet the fans, and uh, it's been most enjoyable. Uh, I'm a people person. I enjoy meeting people, and uh, the fans on Oaks Day, Derby Day, have, uh, have been the best. And it's just, it's just been a wonderful experience for me. And look forward to do, to doing it again in the future. We look forward to having you. Thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. God bless you and your and your viewers.